Okay, so uh, last time we left off talking about the futurists who celebrated war. They were particularly celebrating um, World War I, um, or as it is historically called, the Great War. They hoped it would bring change through destruction. And I talked about that and how that's a little bit of a problematic belief. Um, other artists, and I would say probably the majority of artists in Europe at this time, um, were horrified by war and were horrified by World War I particularly. So that was not, um, this idea put forth by the futurists to the glory of war was not a, um, was not the only opinion at the time and, and was, and was not the majority opinion among creative types at least. Um, okay. So this is the advent of, um, just to put you in the mindset of what's happening here, World War I is, is the advent of these new war strategies that were particularly horrific, um, like trench warfare, like uh, gas shells and poison gas and heavy artillery with machine gunners. Um, so people were totally slaughtered and they were slaughtered on a scale that had not been seen before this time. So it, it was extremely destructive and extremely upsetting. Um, nine million soldiers in Europe were killed during World War I, which is a pretty staggering number, particularly for the time period that we're in. Um, Britain, in one of the earlier battles of the war, um, the Battle of Somme in uh, 1916, just in that battle, the British lost 60,000 men, lost 60,000 soldiers, just in this first kind of opening battle that they engaged with. Um, it, it was gruesome. It was gruesome and it was terrifying. Um, World War I, the um, end to the fighting is finally negotiated in um, 1919. Um, but that isn't the real end, you know? I mean, the, the physical and the psychological damage done to people and, and done to Europe um, is long lasting, okay? So, so it definitely has a huge impact in the art world. Um, and in the art world, one of the results is um, the Dada movement, okay? So if you think back to my lecture on the Enlightenment, I know that's been, it seems like it's been a long time ago now, but if you think back to when I was talking to you about the Enlightenment, um, and maybe even go back and just watch the very beginning of that or reread the notes. So we have, just to jog your memory, we have Voltaire, we have Locke, we have um, encyclopedias, we have um, Mary Wollstonecraft, we have all these people, right, all these important thinkers who are talking about empiricism and observation. Remember Newton is another figure, the scientist uh, Isaac Newton. Um, okay, so that's the Enlightenment. The Dadaists believe that the Enlightenment and the kind of reasoning and thinking that emerged from it um, are bad. They think that that's responsible for World War I. Um, they think that that's responsible for the spectacle of global homicide. That is how they describe the war. And they think it's responsible for the massive destruction that resulted from World War I. So they decide, the Dadaists decide, that the only salvation for humanity must be the opposite, whatever the opposite of uh, the Enlightenment thinking is, which is to be irrational, intuitive, and to enact political anarchy, right? So the complete opposite of what the Enlightenment thinkers thought. So um, Dada kind of, it starts independently in a couple of places. So it starts both in New York City and also in Zurich. Um, but it spreads to Berlin and Paris and Cologne. If you look at my notes, I talk a little bit about the Cabaret Voltaire, which is started in um, Zurich and is kind of the hangout for some of the big figures in Dada. Um, basically, Dada is more of a concept or a mindset than it is a specific style, okay? And it's a, it's a mindset that's, that's fairly pervasive at this time among artists. Andre Breton, who we will talk about more when we talk about surrealism, said, Cubism was a school of painting, futurism a political movement, and Dada is a state of mind. So he kind of summarizes what really um, made Dada tick, essentially. 
And its cornerstone, the cornerstone of Dada, is absurdity. So um, the origin of the name has a lot of different explanations. Um, some people say it's like baby talk, nonsense words. Um, some people say, you know, it's it's like baby talk because it's going back to a time of innocence before reason and thinking. But my favorite anecdote that explains where it comes from is that one of them, I think maybe Tristan Zara, but I don't remember which one exactly, took a knife and stuck it into the side of um, a French dictionary and opened it. And the knife blade sat on the word dada, which is the French word for like a hobby horse, like a like a stick horse that you would play on. And so that's how they came up with their name. I don't know for sure if that's true. That's one of the anecdotes going around, but I kind of like that one. Um, okay, Dada is often described as anti-art. Um, they definitely wanted to undermine art and the art world. Um, despite their desire to express disgust with a world that left them kind of war wary and um, very pessimistic, uh, Dada also produces some art that is um, powerful and extremely influential. So even if they don't necessarily want to be producing important art that bolsters and supports development in the art world, they accidentally do. Um, they also spark uh, a serious examination of the premise of art, which has kind of been a question since we got into the 20th century, right? Um, and then some of their work is, is kind of lighthearted and playful and, and humorous, and we'll start by looking at a few examples of that kind of work. Um, Dadas are also influenced by Freud, who I talked about a little bit, and we'll talk about him a little more when we talk about surrealism. Um, but they're influenced by Freud, and they're influenced by Carl Jung. So... Um, they basically they had an interest in the unconscious and subconscious mind and the uh, inner drives within our unconscious mind and they were also very interested in the spontaneous and the intuitive because those kind of contradict ideas about reason from the enlightenment right um so Jung's ideas about the collective unconscious was particularly of interest to the dadas okay uh so Let's talk about Gene Arp. Gene Arp is born in 1887. He lives until 1966. Um, so to talk kind of about this particular piece, um, there's a Dada filmmaker. Uh, his name is Hans Richter. And um, his films explore the idea of chance, which is another thing that the Dadaists were very interested in. Um, and how, like, as Dadas, they believe that entrusting themselves and their creative process to chance would connect them to their unconscious minds. They believe that this, that by leaving things up to chance, it it was revealing things um, about their their unconscious that they they otherwise couldn't connect with. So Jean Arp uh, wanted to explore Richter and his ideas about chance and use them to compose images. Um, Arp is most well known as a sculptor. He does kind of simple, um, kind of minimalist sculptor sculptures. Um, late, but that's later in his career. With the Dada movement, his ideas about the role of chance um, in terms of composition are his main contribution to the movement. Um, he's influenced by the Cubists. He had prior to this work with the Dadas, he had been making work that directly engaged with the ideas of cubism that we talked about last time. Um, but for, for this work, he roughly tears up different colors of paper and then he drops it so it falls at random. Then he maybe tweaks it a little bit and arranges it a little bit. But basically he thought that chance and the resulting imbalance from giving up creative control and just letting these things be arranged by chance restored the mysteriousness of his art and created um, vitality and interest. So he thought that this was a way to kind of rejuvenate and bring interest back into his work. Um, so from this, improvisation and chance become important parts of the Dada's methodology and, and become kind of incorporated into their, their wheelhouse of technique. Um, and this reliance on chance uh, and kind of the renunciation of artistic control reinforces the anarchy and the subversion that were at the center of the Dada movement. 
Okay, uh, Francis Picabia. Francis Picabia is born in 1879 and he lives until 1953. Uh, this is a photograph of this work. The original work has been lost to time. Um, but basically, Francis Picabia, like Marcel Duchamp, who I'm going to talk about a lot today, um, Picabia is kind of an art world chameleon, okay? Um, I saw a retrospective of his work at the MoMA in New York a couple of years ago. I think it was in 2017. Um, and I went to see the show because it was the last day of the show and I was in New York to see um, artwork. But I kind of like wasn't that interested in Francis Picabia. I'd never really learned about him um, in school and I, I didn't have much of an interest. But I went to his show and I was... I was kind of shocking. I was shocked and delighted by by his work. He's a very similar figure to Marcel Duchamp. They were actually good friends. Um, so Duchamp is one of the more famous and more influential artists from art history, and Francis Picabia is not as well known. But he's really interesting um, because he uh, he just kind of participated in everything. Okay, so he was an Impressionist, and then he was a Faubist, and then he was a Cubist, and then he was involved with Dada, and then he got into Surrealism. So he he's maybe mostly remembered as a Surrealist, but he kind of did everything, including he had a whole series of works that fit in with the machine um, the machine aesthetic that we talked about last time and kind of Orphism, and he did all these drawings of hybrid human machines that were really interesting. Okay, so he's a interesting figure that doesn't get talked about a lot, so that's why I wanted to throw him in here. Um, this piece I like because I think it kind of shows us the humorous and kind of playful side of the Dadaists. So this is called Portrait of Cezanne, and so it has this toy monkey that's one of those toy monkeys that like bang symbols, and it's broken and it's been nailed to this piece of cardboard, and then as Portrait of Cezanne, Portrait of Renoir, Portrait of Rembrandt, Nature de Mort, which means the nature of death. So essentially what he's saying here is that Cezanne is a monkey, Cezanne is a joke, as are Rembrandt and Renoir. All of these people are jokes. This is the way to death. This is not the way of making good art. So he's kind of just trashing like these respected standby people in the art world, particularly Cezanne, because as we've talked about, Cezanne is super important to the development of modernism and modern art and Cubists, which Picabi himself was a part of those movements. So he's really kind of like poking fun at the art world here. Okay. Let's talk about Marcel Duchamp. So he has a lot in common with Francis Picabia, except that he is much, much more famous and, and more well-regarded. Um, so like Picabia, Duchamp participates in virtually all of the art movements of the first half of the 20th century. Um, and I'm not exaggerating there. Um, he did all the things, but he does all of it with a little bit of a smirk, a little bit of like a tongue in cheek out of the corner of his eye. I always feel like when I'm looking at Marcel Duchamp and when I go back and read about him, I always get this feeling that he's just laughing at everyone, that he's just making fun of the art world. So he participates, but he participates in a way that he thinks he's maybe a little smarter than everybody and a little maybe above everything. Um, so he has that kind of feeling about him. And um, let's just talk, we'll, we'll talk about who he is a little bit, basically. So he's probably the most influential Dadaist, and he is, in fact, possibly one of the most influential artists in the 20th century. Um, he was French, but he was also very involved and kind of in the center of the New York Dada movement. Um, he also worked in Paris quite a lot around this time. He was born in northern France. He was born in a town in uh, Normandy. His maternal grandfather was a well-regarded engraver. His name was Emile Frédéric Nicole. Uh, and, and so he grew up in a house with a lot of art, a lot of engravings by his grandfather. His family was very supportive of the idea of artists. In fact, three of his siblings also become successful artists. That's Jacques Villa, Raymond duchamp Villa, Suzanne duchamp Croti. So he has... Um, artists in his family and his family is generally supportive of this as a path for people to take. His early work was very influenced by Odilon Ridon. So we 
looked at him in the symbolist uh, symbolism lecture. He's the one who did the Cyclops, the, the painting of the Cyclops. Um, he's very influenced by him. He's also very interested in um, post-impressionism as a style and, and conceptually interested in post-impressionism. He went to Academy Julia, which is also where um, Matisse went. It's also later where Louise Bourgeois goes. A lot of famous artists go there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. He did not stay very long at the Academy. He kind of gets bored. He starts playing a lot of pool and just kind of goofing off. Uh, in 1905, he served. So you had a compulsory duty to serve in the military. So in 1905, he joins the military and he's stationed in Rua. Um, and there he's stationed with a printmaker. So he learns how to make all these military leaflets and information. But more importantly, he learns a lot about typography and printmaking at the time, which he later uses in some of his work. Um, his work is shown at the Autumn Salon in 1908. The only reason he was able to submit to that is because his older brother Jacques was a member of the Academy and, and kind of got him in. Um, that's where he meets Bacavia. They become lifelong friends. Um, excuse me. It's persistent tickle in my throat. <coughs> okay. Uh, in 1911, he and his brothers um, host kind of a regular art discussion at Jacques' house. Jacques is his older brother. Um, and a lot of Cubist artists come to this. So uh, Juan Gris and Jean Metzinger, who we looked at last time. Also some of the Orphis, uh, Robert Delany and um, uh, Bernard Lager and also Picavia, all, all come and they, they have these big art discussions pretty regularly. Um, one of you, let's see. So at this time he, he gets interested in fourth dimensional art and the ideas of cubism and the ideas of how that can affect painting. And he takes some of those ideas, but he applies it in a very singular style. One of you is writing about nude descending a star staircase number two which is a work he does at this time, and is kind of his version of cubism, where he's mostly focused on the ideas of fourth dimension and time and movement. After this, he starts losing interest in painting around 1912. Uh, the paintings he does after this time are, they're not, they're paintings, but they're not very painterly. They kind of take on a more technical diagram kind of draftsman-like quality. <coughs> we'll look at one of them in a minute. Um, and basically for a while, starting in 1913, um, he gets a day job, he becomes a librarian, and while he's a librarian, he uses access to books and this time to educate himself on mathematics and physics, so he develops this other kind of interest. Then he has a big breakthrough and he creates his first ready-made. His first ready-made was a bicycle wheel, a single bicycle wheel. Um, attached to the top of a stool, like a wooden bar stool. Um, Ready-mades were his invention, and they were mass-produced common objects. Uh, we call them sometimes in art found objects. So the artist just selects an object that already exists in the world. He does not make it. He or she does not make it. They select the object, and they set it aside, sometimes altering it in some way, sometimes combining it with another object. But what makes it art is that the artist selects it, elevates it, and says, this is art. So this is kind of the birth of conceptual art, okay? So this is really the art making happens in the mind of the artist because it is their designation that is making it art. So this is pretty radical. Uh, so we'll look at a couple of these. So this is a two-dimensional example of a ready-made. So this was a print of the Mona Lisa, and he drew a mustache and a goatee on it, and wrote the letters L-H-O-O-Q. This is also a visual pun and kind of a dirty joke. Has anyone taken French? If you have, um, if you pronounce these letters in French, L-H-O-O-Q, it sounds like a French sentence that translates roughly to, she has a hot ass. Very mature, Marcel Duchamp. So he, you can see like this kind of humorous side that Dada has. So um, that is a two-dimensional example. Let's look at this. Um, this is his most famous ready-made. And uh, put his in quotes because we're going to talk about a controversy that has come up about it recently. But we'll, we'll talk about it as if it is his first. Um, so this is called The Fountain. 
And uh, the artist's signature here is actually this, as he explains post-1950, is this witty pseudonym that he comes up with, uh, R. Mutt. And it's basically two names, J.L. Mott, M-O-T-T, -T, which was an ironworks company that made plumbing. And then um, from the a popular comic strip at the time, Mutt and Jeff, Mutt was the taller one. So he says much, much later when he actually claims that he made this post-1950, that that is how he came up with the signature that he paints on it with black. It's, it's an upside down urinal is what it is. And so this gets submitted to a salon exhibition. It, everybody freaks out. It's a huge deal. There's a big reaction to it. Um, and this, like with all of his ready-mades, the art is not the thing itself. It is the selection of the thing, right? The selection of the object. Okay, so when I studied art history, this was Marcel Duchamp. This was the definitive Marcel Duchamp piece. Now I'm going to tell you a story that came out pretty recently that seems like it's probably true. There's been a whole book written about it. Um, so I have a little caveat here. I love Marcel Duchamp. I think he's super important and we still need to talk about him. But this particular work that's ascribed to him, The Fountain, is probably not actually his. Um, so it was submitted to the salon anonymously, just with the signature R. Mutt as the person submitting it. Um, and in some of the forms, it indicates that maybe this artist was submitting it all the way from Philadelphia. Uh, okay, so recent research has been done showing that the fountain may not have been Duchamp's idea, and in fact, he may not have painted R. Mutt on it or submitted it at all. Um, he did invent, he was kind of the originator of, of ready-made. So far as we know, that is totally his. It's just this particular one is not. So this is Baroness Elsa von Freytag Lorenhoven. Um, she lives from 1874 to 1927. And it looks like she is the person who actually submitted the fountain to the exhibition and painted our mutt on it. Um, in a 1917 letter to his sister Susan, Duchamp says, one of my female friends adopted the masculine pseudonym Richard Mutt and in a porcelain and entered in a porcelain urinal as a sculpture. So he was very amused by this. He loved this. He thought it was great because someone was using this ready-made idea that he had come up with in this um, very direct, very uh, kind of comical way that also really upset the art world. So he thought it was pretty great. Um, R. Mutt at the time was, as I said, identified as an artist living in Philadelphia, which was where Elsa was living at this time. Um, she is... She was a German-born poet um, and also an artist. She wrote under the pseudonym Richard Mutt from time to time. The handwriting she wrote her poetry in looks like the handwriting on the urinal. Um, and then, so in 1935, it is Andre Breton, who is very involved with the Surrealists. We'll talk about him a lot with the Surrealists. He is the one who... Um, attributes the fountain to Marcel Duchamp. He just assumes that it was Marcel Duchamp because Marcel Duchamp is the one who came up with ready-mades. So he figures that Marcel submitted it anonymously as this R. Mutt character as one of his kind of big plays on the art world. Duchamp says nothing. He does not claim that it is his or not at the time. It isn't until 1950, many, many years after Elsa has died, that Duchamp does say that he is the one who did the fountain, and that's when he comes up with this, this story about where the um, pseudonym R. Mutt came from. Okay, so it appears that Duchamp was not actually the person who was behind one of the most famous works in the 20th century, the fountain. Um, with art history, you know, things are evolving. As, as people discover new things, it's important to acknowledge them and not be static because we find out more and new information every day. So I want to put this caveat in here that it is quite possible, and it seems fairly likely from what I've read so far, that Duchamp did not actually make the fountain. Okay, back to talking about something Duchamp did make. Uh, let's look at one of his non-ready-made works. So this is his, what, one of his most visually and conceptually challenging works. Uh, it's one of my favorites of his works. He started it in 1915, so right before um, 
he's gets he moves to New York and gets involved. Uh, he moves to New York around this time because he wants to get away from World War One. So he starts his work, then he doesn't finish it. And he comes back and he finishes it in 1923. Um, it's simultaneously kind of playful and humorous, while at the same time it's um, it's kind of critical and and kind of serious, and it's it's an examination of humans as machines and how humans function as machines. Um, it is oil paint, um, foil, gold foil, wire, and dust, and they're sandwiched between two um, big pieces of glass. Uh, okay, so it if we look at it, it's some fairly technical looking images, right? So it, it sort of has that kind of technical draftsman-like um, aesthetic that we see with Duchamp after his paintings in 1912, where he sort of abandons um, more painterly styles of painting. Um, he left notes to go with this work to kind of explain it. So um, basically, the title of this is The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelor's Even, The Large Glass. Um, so in this work, The Bride is a motor powered by love gasoline. So in the top panel, this is the bride. She's a motor. This is love gasoline that is powering her. Um, the bachelors are in the lower portion and uh, they appear basically as kind of uniform male figures. So it almost looks like uniforms without figures in them. They're kind of standing in a cluster over to the side here. Um, so those are the bachelors. And then this larger kind of central figure in the lower panel is the chocolate grinder um, in the middle of the lower panel. And he says this represents masturbation. So he notes that the bachelor grinds his own chocolate. Okay, so this is Duchamp's uh, Dadaist reflection on love and sexuality and also maybe kind of poking a little fun at... Um, arts groups that are fixated on these ideas about the machine aesthetic, right? Uh, so he's kind of like, well, if humans are machines, here's some humans as machines. And and he's, he's sort of, like I said, everything he does is a little bit tongue-in-cheek and a little bit sort of poking fun at the art world. Um, I think it's kind of a lovely painting, actually. Um, I'm a big fan of painting on translucent uh, substrate. Uh, okay, so... In true Dada form, uh, back thinking about what Jean Arp said at the beginning of this lecture, Chance kind of completes this work. So in 1927, it's being transported for an exhibition, and it gets broken. So you can see on the right, this is before it's broken. On the left is uh, when it's, it's broken. Um, instead of just replacing the broken piece of glass, Duchamp very carefully collects all the little shards of glass pieces them together, and then sandwiches the whole thing, broken glass and all, between two bigger, heavier pieces of glass to protect it. So he decides that this is now part of the artwork, is, is that it's broken. Um, so that's a very, like, Duchamp move. It's a very Dadaist move. Duchamp is a fascinating figure. Um, he approached art and life with the belief that each act, everything you do as an artist or a person, is individual and unique, and that that is kind of the creative force behind life, is the new uniqueness of each individual's decision making. Um, so everyone's choice of a found object would be different, and that difference is what the creative spark is. So he's a very interesting figure, and he definitely has a huge impact on the art world, even if he stole the fountain. Okay, uh, Dada spreads throughout Europe, and in 1917, it arrives in Berlin. Um, and in Berlin, the version of Dada we get is a little more pointedly political. It, it still has some of the chaos, some of the absurdity, but it's a little bit more um, undermining and more precise in what it's undermining and what its political message is. Um, Okay, so the Berlin Dadas develop the cubist idea of collage, papier collé, which we talked about last time, in an, in kind of a new and intense way. They really kind of make collage into what we think of collage today. 
and they use the word um, photomontage instead of papier collé or instead of collage. Um, one of the Berlin Dadas who perfected the photomontage technique was Hannah Heusch. Um, she's born in 1889, she dies in 1978. So she created absurd, chaotic, and very contradictory and kind of wild, dense looking uh, collages and photomontages with cut photos from magazines and found photography. Um, she arranged these eclectic mixtures of cutouts in sometimes what seems like a haphazard fashion. Um, this work, cut with the kitchen knife Dada through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epoch of Germany, um, it seems like it's kind of random and arranged by chance, right? When you first look at it, it just looks, it's kind of overwhelming. There's no real place for your eye to, to land. But when you really study it, it's actually very carefully arranged and the photos are very intentionally selected. Um, it's also not just whimsical, which it at first has this kind of whimsy and, and playful chaos about it, but um, it's actually quite scathing and insightful in its commentary. And what it's being scathing and insightful and commenting on is uh, the Weimar Republic. So from, you probably know this from history, but from 1918 to 1933, um, the state in gov uh, the state, the government in Germany is called the Weimar Republic. Um, okay, so this is piece is being particularly critical of two big developments that come up during the Weimar Republic. Uh, the first is the redefinition of women's social roles, and the second is the explosive growth of mass print media. So these are the two things that really are the underlying issues uh, in this piece. Um, okay, so let's look at this thing a little more closely. The key figures from the Weimar Republic government appear in the upper right-hand corner, up in the right, up there, uh, and they are labeled with cut out words that say uh, the anti-Dada movement in German, basically. So she labels the leaders of this Weimar Republic saying they are anti-Dada. Um, some of her fellow Dadas appear among the images um, with Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin. And so this putting them together um, kind of aligns Dada with other revolutionary um, forces um, which Hoysch then labels all of them, the Dadas and uh, Marx and Stalin, or not Stalin, excuse me, Lenin, all together. She labels them with um, <clears throat> Die Großwelt Dada, <coughs> excuse me, which means uh, the great world of Dada, okay? Um, she also positions herself. She's down in the lower uh, right-hand corner. She's kind of in this tipsy topsy turvy world of Dada. Um, and a photograph of her head appears in the lower right. It is juxtaposed with the map of Europe. Um, so Hoysch, she's an early feminist, and this work is a proclamation on the power of both women and the Dada movement to uh, destabilize and undermine society at the time, and society that's, that's kind of horrible and makes war and is sexist. Okay. Um, here are some other examples of her work. I'm a huge fan of Hannah Hoysch. Um, I have a separate lecture that I did for a different class that's all about Hannah Hoysch and um, Dada cut up poetry, which I have the PowerPoint for, and I think I'll just record my lecture on that and post that too as kind of a bonus material about Hannah Hoysch. She is pretty rad. Okay. <coughs> Neue Zaklitaik. I put out the phonetically how you say this movement, because I know German is tricky. Um, okay, so this means new objectivity. And it's an art movement in Germany that also reacts against the horrors of World War I. So it has a kind of similar goals and a similar impetus to Dada, but unlike Dada, it does this in a very um, clear, very direct and straightforward way. So it doesn't turn to absurdity and being tricky and being funny, 
like Dada does. Instead, it just directly is like, here are the horrors of the world. Why is the world like this? And it's very um, kind of straightforward, generally speaking. Okay, so one of the main figures of this movement is George Gross. Uh, he's born in 1893. He lives until 1958. He is also for a bit associated with the Dada movement in Berlin, like Hena Hoysch, but he basically finds that Neue Zeklik Teich is more his speed. He doesn't, he kind of thinks that the Dadaists are a little too, um, too absurd for him, I guess. He wants to be more direct. Um, this is the largest work that he ever completes. It's called The Eclipse of the Sun. Um, some of his paintings depict war and battlefield scenes themselves, uh, even more directly. This one does not. Uh, this is maybe his most famous painting, though. Um, so it's still a stinging critique of militarization and also of capitalism, as most of his work is. Um, it takes its title from the large red coin that you see in the upper corner that is blotting out the sun. Um, the main figure is uh, Paul von Hindenburg, so in the kind of military outfit that's Paul von Hindenburg. He um, at this time was the president of Germany, um, and he here he's having a meeting with his um, <clears throat> cabinet ministers, with the, the kind of his advisors and his government, and they are depicted here as not having heads. The reason Hindenburg um, is presenting to these headless figures is because Gross and other artists <clears throat> of this movement and other people at the time thought that Hindenburg uh, basically just didn't listen to, like his, his advisors just did whatever he said and, and nobody actually contradicted him or challenged him in any way. So he made a lot of what were perceived as bad decisions and um, his, his cabinet was, they didn't think for themselves, basically. Um, okay. So they're following his orders without question. Then this guy in a top hat with all these uh, weapons under his arm. This is a very wealthy um, industrialist who is whispering in his ear, in the president's ear, and telling him what he wants him to do and what he thinks he should do. So he has a voice and is swaying him, whereas these experts, his ministers and his cabinet, are headless and have no voice and are not giving him advice to counter what this industrialist warmongering guy is saying. Okay. Um, it's also a comment on the gullible public. So we have this donkey on the table. It has blinders on, so it literally can't see what's happening at the table around it. So this is supposed to be the public being blind to what's happening. And instead of looking around and seeing what's going on, it's just eating these newspapers. Okay, so basically he's saying this is, the public is this mindless creature, which, you know, is an ass. Uh, and they're just gobbling up what the media, which at this time is, is controlled by the government, so it's uh, government and um, industry-friendly media just spreading this propaganda and lies, and they just eat it up and are blind to it. So that's what that is. And then, of course, we have the skull on the ground, we have the person trapped underneath uh, the floor, we have a bloody sword on the table. So there's all these things talking about the destruction of war and, and the consequences of this behavior. So much more direct than some of the, the stuff we see from the Dadaist. Okay, another artist from um, New Objectivity is um, Max Beckerman. He's born in 1884, he dies in 1950. He believed, um, kind of like the futurists, he believed that a better society would emerge from the chaos of war. So he went into the war period thinking that good things would come, um, but over time, as the war rages on and it's so devastating and so destructive, he becomes totally disillusioned with this notion. Um, he then begins to make work that emphasizes the horrors of war. Um, this painting is called Night. And in it, we are in this cramped space um, seeing horrible things happen to a family. Um, so we see three invaders, um, and we see this woman who is bound and has been partially stripped, the implication being that she has been raped. Um, she's in the foreground. 
then we see uh, one of the intruders is strangling the woman's husband in the corner. Um, we see the third intruder is about to take off with their child kind of tucked in his coat um, and, and the child's feet kind of appear up. Uh, it's a little distorted, but you can see the, the kid, the blonde kid's head is here and his feet are up above. So the, the intruder is bodily carrying him, kidnapping him and taking him away. Um, so it's brutal and horrible what's happening here, right? Uh, that is intentional. The wrenching brutality is a searing comment on society's condition, both during the war and directly after the war, when everything's kind of chaotic. Um, and he made this personal in a way that's kind of disturbing. He and his family were the models for this. So he is the husband, his wife modeled for the uh, woman, and his, his son is the model for the child. Um, so looking at it stylistically, when we look at the stilted um, angularity of the work, the distorted figures, um, the kind of rough linear brush strokes, it brings to mind German Expressionism, right? So this has a pretty clear lineage to German Expressionism. Um, and it's, it's done in this way to kind of reflect on the world's violence. Um, everything feels kind of contorted, kind of illogical, like the way the kid is, is kind of flipped around. Um, so it, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable, essentially. It's, it's supposed to be disturbing and uncomfortable. Okay, this is the last thing we'll look at today. So this is Otto Dix. Um, he's born in 1891. He dies in 1969. He actually fought in World War I, um, and he was an aerial observer in a plane, like kind of observing where the military was moving, and he also um, was a machine gunner. So he was out slaughtering people. Um, he, like Beckman, initially thought good would come out of the war. Um, he volunteered because he wanted to experience the depths of life this is a concept that comes from uh, Nietzsche, particularly Nietzsche's um, The Joyous Science, which we know Otto Dix was a huge fan of his. Um, so he signs up thinking that this is going to, in the end, be a good thing and it's going to help society. Um, as the war rages on, he loses faith completely in the potential of improving society through war and bloodshed. Um, so this is one of his works. It's a uh, triptych uh, called Dirk Krieg. Dirk Krieg means uh, the war in German. Um, and it vividly captures the devastation war inflicts on humans and also the environment. Like it literally tears up the terrain and the earth. Um, okay, so in the left panel, we have the soldiers marching on. They're marching away from the battle. Um, then in the center and the right panels, we see mangled bodies riddled with bullets. It's very graphic and upsetting. Um, and uh, we have this look at this kind of apocalyptic looking landscape. It's very hellish and rough and torn up. Um, and then if you look at the right panel, we have this kind of ghostly looking figure, the soldier who's left in the aftermath, but he's kind of determined to pull this injured person out uh, off of the battlefield. That figure is actually a self-portrait of Otto Dix, um, so he makes it quite personal. Um, the bottom panel, the below the center table, the center uh, panel, excuse me, is something that is probably meant to be a bunker but it could also look like the interior of a large kind of coffin. Um, so the idea is we have these figures who are probably soldiers and they look like they're sleeping, but the eerie part is we don't know if they're sleeping. They could be dead um, in this bunker below. So that's purposefully ambiguous um, just to, to cause more dissonance, to cause, uh, to cause you to feel uncomfortable and upset and, and the ideas of uh, the impact of war and the uncertainty of war. So, as you can see from all of this, we have these two movements that come out of World War I and take a very different 
path than the futurists where they're very critical and um, take very different um, ideas and paths to be critical, right? So we have the absurdity of the Dadaists who are undermining art, this kind of anti-art movement, and then we have new objectivity and their idea is just to show the horrors and show the terrible things that are happening. Okay, I will see you next time. We will talk about supremism and constructivism and then later we will talk about surrealism. <laughs>